So our next speaker, he is on the management board of an independent, family-owned company that always distinguished itself through innovative products and technology. New and good ideas are also very important to them and they cooperate a lot and support with startups. And they are a global player with their headquarters here close to Stuttgart in Essling, in a beautiful city, um, the pneumatic and electrical automation technology company Festo that we already heard a few times today. And it's director of product and technology management. He has a background in mechanical engineering and a PhD, so perfect speaker for this conference. So welcome Frank Melzer here on stage. Dear Dr. Hofmeister Kraut, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here at that renowned conference and take you to a tour through the future of industrial automation. And it will be more a technology-driven uh, tour as I'm the CTO of Festo. And so technology is in the heart, but we see a lot how this interacts uh, into our future, into the business, and also uh, how it indexed to us as part of the manufacturing industry. Well, Festo mentioned, has been mentioned a couple of times already, and Festo, to describe Festo by numbers, it's more than 300,000 customers, 33,000 cust uh, catalog products, and 3 billion euro turnover. We are a family-owned business and very, very global in 176 countries active, and very proud to be a Swabian, really a Swabian company. So we combine the world and Swabia in Festo. And it has been mentioned we are a product company for factory and process automation with namely a pneumatic and electric automation. And as a product company, I start my tour, of course, with a product. But with a different product, if you think of. I start with a Nokia 3210. Who had one in the past? Yeah, here we, here, oh, we have a lot of fans here. <laughs> and this is a true classic product. Not only this is just the icon of design, and probably you can find it in many museums, it's a classical product, single function, robust, designed to the customer, and then it works. What do we do, use today? We use the smartphone, all of us use the smartphone, and the big difference here is it has much more functions. It has sensing, intelligence, it has communication and software-based functions. We all are surprised that calling is a minor function, and my kids are surprised that you use that for calling. <laughs> so it, it opens up the space for all of us, uh, the smartphone. And why did I start with a uh, consumer electronics product? Because it's not much different in industry. We have these classic products, and it's an air preparation unit here. And we still have very classic products, but on the other side, we have the same unit, air preparation unit, equipped with sensing, intelligent, communication, and software-based functions. There's one difference, and I just mentioned it. We have in our portfolio both products, because we deliver to very classical uh, industries where this is a replacement, but we also have these new products for a multiple way of usage. And how are they connected in a, in, a, in a factory? And automation industry typically takes the so-called pyramid. Uh, that's a very hierarchical uh, system, how it's being organized, and the lower level and the field level are the components, and they talk to a central unit, uh, to the controller. And with Industry 4.0, we added the cloud on top of that. This is still the picture mostly automation industry works, was this simple picture of, automa of a pyramid. But there are a couple of problems with that. First of all, bandwidth. Uh, you have to channel data through a, really a bottleneck, and then, of course, real time is quite a challenge. So with technology moving in, that pyramid changes to a network, uh, the industrial internet of things. Here, controller moves into nearly all products, intelligent is distributed, and everything is connected. So we can send data across, and we can send data 
across the different products and uh, not along that pyramid anymore. That opens up a new space for us in automation technology, driven by the availability of sensing, communication, computing. And for the next step forward, I take you on a small history tour in IT. It started around 1900 with tabulating systems. And the driver was in the US, the census 1890. Uh, and big data at that time, how to manage big data. And the punch cards were there. Big machines. And the paradigm shift was the computing as we know today of 1950s was the involvement of the computer. And then there was a bigger step in 2015. And we will have that in our books of computing and IT. That's when artificial intelligence, or namely machine learning, went finally after, after many, many years of research and hidden into real life. The cognitive time started, cognitive systems started. All this has one thing in common. Huge computing, huge machines were necessary. Now, we are a component manufacturer, and industry consists of many, many different components. So there's a big challenge now with bringing artificial intelligence on resource-constrained systems, less power, less data transfer, and a requirement in real time. And the component you see here is one of the first components where, on a small edge computing, we have equipped real-time machine learning. So it's there. We can build data models and find with machine learning abnormalities of machines and components. Really interesting field opened up, a new world of uh, data analysis started, driven by reducing the requirements of uh, the machine learning to real-time applications on the fairly small edge computing. And coming back to the larger picture, how does Index, and I like that picture because it's an interplay between a machine, machine learning or artificial intelligence and the human. And it's not either or, it's an end. In, uh, uh, both or all the different parties communicate each other. We see human-machine interaction, we see machine ma to machine interaction, and we see optimizing of these processes. Artificial intelligence is there in real time, and in future we even see real time interactions, not only between human and machine, but also between machine and machine. And this is not too far away. We are on the edge of having that reality. And it's not with or without the human, the human plays a really important role in that, in that cycle with its intelligence, with the learning capabilities, but will get some load uh, from his shoulders with the repetitiveness, with the correctness, what a machine can do. And that opens up new spaces for us. Looking again for a broader picture, uh, manufacturing will be interconnected. Uh, we will see a horizontal and vertical integration, and it's nearly on the hand when you see all the connectivity uh, issues we can solve today. Data is everywhere. Data can be outside, can be inside of the, of the company. We still have a lot of question of data privacy and who owns the data. But in principle, we can do among industries, among companies, businesses. And solutions in that space are not longer purely proprietary. And we think the next step is a global and especially a very open ecosystem. That's technology spoken, but also from a political side that has some parallels. With the open system, we can do much better business, and that will be what we will see in future between companies. In talking about uh, the business model, and there's the analogum from the mobile phone. The Nokia was also built and it was given to the user and many of us use it still today and there was little interaction between Nokia and the user. It's very different with a smartphone. All of a sudden there's value, uh, there creates new, new apps, new possibilities, you send data through and a whole new world of business model is involving in that space. We all know of that. And it's the focus on value creation in smart services. There's no difference in industry. With the product on the right-hand side, with the air preparation unit, which is connected, 
we can exchange data in the, in the space of the customer within the cloud or within the uh, manufacturing or a cloud somewhere else. We can communicate, we exchange data, and we've seen that with this data exchange and sensing and intelligence, we can save 30% of energy in pneumatic systems, in the manufacturing. Because we can control it, we can see it, we can adopt it to the uh, particular needs. And that's a service on top of that based on software, and it's a value service. We have lots of customers who are asking for that type because it brings them out of the pure mechanical world into a, a flexible, controlled world, optimizing their needs. And energy saving is certainly one of the needs a lot of manufacturing has. And to the end of that quick technology tour, I want to show you what we did with different technologies at Festo in a concept phase, bringing different technologies together in designing the workplace of the future. This is a concept we showed at Hannover Fair this year in March. Uh, it's a conceptual stage, but gives you a good glimpse of how the technologies come, to come together for workplace of the future. the individualized product base Peter 2018. Okay, let's go. But let's make the stand first. Starting cutting process. Okay. Okay, thanks. So thanks a lot for taking part in that quick tour on the future of automation and looking forward for the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much.